All right, well, it's 704. We'll actually we'll actually dive in and, and start on content. Did you do yourself? Oh, sorry. Yeah, well, I have a slide. I have a slide for that. <laughs> Um, I will say before we dive in, uh, we are graciously able to do this here at the the charity of the Solid State Depot, but they also would love your help. I'm asking $20 donation on their website if you guys are willing. If you're unable to, totally fine. There's no like actual fee for it, but if you can chip into the space to help fund it, they appreciate it. Um, so I'm Carter Schultz. Um, I've been a professional software developer for about 10 years. I've been using Rust professionally for about the last two years. Um, I have been like a staunch C++ guy the whole time and coming from C++ to Rust, I am such a convert, guys. Like, um, I care enough about it to like teach the class and kind of like evangelize our, our sort of crab god. Um, I recently released my first open source uh, Rust package. It's called Rosslib Rust. It uh, lets you access ROS, the robot operating system, in a particular way through a particular JSON WebSocket protocol they have that's not the normal one, but is super convenient if you want to talk to a fleet of robots using like cloud functions. Um, and we're using it at my job. So I got my job hooked on open source. And uh, we, we recently built a control system for an entire factory from scratch in Rust. So we run an entire factory off of a single Linux server talking to you know about 450 ethernet devices over a multiple industrial protocols and it works and we just wrote it and it works and i never would have done that in c plus <laughs> plus but in rust I'm, I'm super comfortable about it um i have no idea uh how time is going to go for any of this uh I, I like roughly sketched this out but first time doing it and i'm making this up as i go i roughly have about 10 minutes sort of on the history of rust and where it sits in the programming world context about 10 minutes on basic syntax we're going to cover some structs and enums and the higher level you know data packaging of it and then lifetimes which is the first sort of unique to rust uh, feature that will cover at least the basics of this time we'll probably pick up with lifetimes next time and then go through uh, traits and types the trait system in rust is pretty darn cool but it's also quite a bit to digest um, and then uh, if we have time at the end of all of it, we'll maybe do some macros or async, depending on whether people are more interested in, in which part of the language I think that'll be all about we can fit in. Um, I'm super comfortable if anyone wants to shout out a question at any time and have me explain stuff in more depth, please. This can be as interactive as you guys want. You know, the class is for you. So whatever format uh, works out. So yeah. I noticed on the meetup there's there's another meeting next week. Is this supposed to be a series? This is this is just a two-parter, yeah. So we'll do an hour tonight and an hour next week for the thing. Um they'll they'll both be the same meet link. Um they'll be recorded if you can only make one. Yeah. Sweet. Um, History of Rust, it's a relatively modern language. Um there is a single guy who started it as a side project at Mozilla. Um, after he worked on it for a few years on the side, Mozilla picked it up for internal use and sort of fostered the language through their first stable release. Um, it is a very opinionated language and designed to be modern. It was specifically targeting the needs of browsers where you need to write very high performance code that does a lot of networking where you care an immense about, amount about security and reliability. Um, that turns out to be a very useful set of things that a lot of people care about and a lot of people need. Um, Rust hit its first stable release in 2014, so it's, you know, relatively recently released. Um, there was kind of a scare in the Rust ecosystem because for most of Rust's history, it was sort of solely supported by Mozilla, and Mozilla was um, spending a lot on, on making Rust a language and pushing Rust. Mozilla went through quite a downturn with COVID. Um, since then, though, there has been a huge outreach from other companies who really like what Rust is doing. Um, a separate Rust foundation was split off from Mozilla. Uh, Rust's governance is out in the open and public, and a lot of the major players, particularly in the cloud space, have stepped in to provide support for Rust to continue to be maintained and grown. Um, there's a lot of factors to choose when, when sort of picking a language. The human factors that I think matter for Rust, it's, it's super modern. It's on the bleeding edge of, of the tech stack right now. Um, it's very opinionated. There is a right way to do Rust, which I appreciate a lot. Um, there, It comes with a linter, it comes with style guides, it comes with this is how Rust code should be written so that you get a, a sort of cogent, cohesive uh, ecosystem. Uh, large corporate support is take it or leave it how you want. People are being paid to continue making Rust a language. I think that matters. Um, I don't think um, purely open source can take a project as far as it can, as quickly as it can, if it gets some support. 
Um, all of Rust, though, is completely open source. The compiler is everything's out in the open. None of the stuff that the companies are paying for developing is, is private in any way. Um, and it's developed totally in the public. There's a public RFC system. There, there's committees. You can get on the Discord. You can talk directly to the people making language design choices as it goes. So that's great. Um, what is Rust for? Rust's first slogan that matters a lot and I think is kind of the, the most important thing to get right is fast, reliable, productive pick three. Um, Rust is bleeding edge performance at the level of C. You can write raw assembly in it. You can write the lowest level code as you need to go down to the bare silicon to do your AVX instructions. There is zero cost abstractions truly existing in Rust. Um, reliable. Reliable both means that Rust code is naturally correct. It is hard to write errors in Rust. The language tries to force you to write safe code up front, and safe code means safe both in the sense that it will run correctly and safe in the sense of security. Um, Rust is just, it is fundamentally harder to write bugs in than C++. I have seen that firsthand in, in developing with it professionally. Um, Rust pushes a lot to compile time. So, so more and more and more bugs get caught earlier and earlier and earlier with higher compile time checking. Now, the, the last one there, like none of those matter if you can't actually write effective programs in it quickly. Um, Rust is productive. I think Rust has some of the most beautiful and ergonomic syntax for writing high level code. Like people will choose Python over C++. A lot of times Python is so much more productive if you just need to get the code written. I think Rust has a very sharp learning curve, but once you are up to speed in Rust, I think I can write a Rust program faster than any Python developer can write most Python programs these days. Um, that being said, the Rust ecosystem is still fairly new. There are a lot of crates. There is a huge set of open source libraries for it, um, but but there's not nearly as many as Python or, or like C++. Like, like there are there are a lot of Rust libraries, and a lot of them are ports of C and C++ libraries, and um, they're good. It's a high quality ecosystem, but not everything is there. Um, the second major Rust slogan that I think matters a lot, though, I'll put, put these slides out, um, I'll email them out to everybody who signed up on Meetup after this, but um, fearless concurrency. What does that mean? Um, the, an entire class of bugs, which is data races, is completely eliminated by the Rust language at compile time. Um, Rust maintains knowledge of what data is mutable, in what context. It has a concept of threads and thread visibility that is baked into the type system. So at compile time, Rust can guarantee that there is not simultaneous access to the same piece of data. As a C++ developer who works on robots and has written a shitload of multi-threaded code, oh my god, I can't talk about how much of a breath of fresh air that is. Um, final thing to talk about Rust, I said it earlier, but batteries included. Um, Rust is not just a standalone language that here's the language, figure the rest out for yourself. Rust includes a linter, a package system, IDE support, documentation system, test system, benchmarking, all fundamentally built into the logging, into the language, including things like logging, um, so that there are standards for all crates to use, all crates interrupt. When I run tests for my code, I can choose how many of my dependencies tests I also want to run on what environments, on what targets. Um, I can configure logging for all of the packages I use and how much of their logs I want to be visible in what ways and where I want to send their logs. It is because there is a cohesive, just the language has decided this is how we do these things. There is some pretty awesome interoperability throughout the Rust package ecosystem. Um, pause for questions. Okay. Um, we're going to talk now what kind of language is Rust. Um, Rust, I will honestly say, is fixed C++. It is targeting the same place as C++. It has the same style of abstractions as C++, but it is fundamentally with, you know, 30 years of language design knowledge, taking a new crack at what that syntax could look at, what um, that style should look like. Um, Rust is fundamentally imperative. It's not a functional language. You can do functional in it. Um, it is a compiled language. The Rust compiler is built on top of LLVM, so it uses the same backend as if you were using Clang to compile your C++. Um, it's not an interpreted language. Um, Rust is, is statically typed. It's strictly typed. It has a strong type system and an enforced type checker. And I think the sort of biggest thing to get used to in Rust is Rust is not object oriented. Um, Rust has a trait system, which is better. Object oriented programming was a bad idea. Like it's a it's a decent concept, but I think I think Rust has found an even better way of doing it. You can you can do a lot of things in Rust, it, but 
uh, it doesn't force you. Um, here's kind of a table of, this is my um, comparison of sort of Rust against other languages so you can get the, the place of it. A, a lot of people right now will ask the question like Rust or Go, Rust or Go. Um, if you care about garbage collection, Rust. If you don't care about garbage collection, Rust or Go, I don't really care. Um, I personally hate garbage collectors. I know Go has done wonders to try to make garbage collection better, but Go will never be as fast, will never be as reliable. And I think Go is fundamentally less safe. Um, Rust actually does enforce more compile time safety mechanisms than Go does. Um, yeah. Can you take a picture of this? I will send these slides out, but yeah, take all the pictures you want. Um, other thing to mention about Rust, so Rust has all of the safety, Rust has all of these uh, amazing checks, all these amazing guarantees I've, I've stated. Uh, if you actually wanted to write stuff in those, with those guarantees always in effect, uh, you could never write any real code. Anytime you're on an operating system and you make a system call, you're exiting Rust's boundary of what the language can enforce and a, someone has to say what is safe or what is not safe about that system call as they wrap it. Rust includes a thing called the unsafe keyword and the unsafe context where you can step outside the, the memory safety rules and the synchronous rules and you say, I as the developer know I've written this chunk of code directly and you can do all of the evil bit hacking you can do in C in Rust um, and then you exit that unsafe context and return back to the rules of Rust and you, the developer, said, okay, I wrote this chunk of code correctly, compiler, trust me. Um, writing unsafe code in Rust is, is hard. There's a lot of rules to follow, more than there are rules in other languages so that Rust can understand what your unsafe code is doing and what your raw assembly that you've put in the middle of it uh, is expected to do or not do. Um, there's a wonderful book called the Rust Nomicon, which is the, the uh, Bible for unsafe Rust when you get to that. But just know I'm going to show you this, the safe parts of Rust today. We're not talking about unsafe but uh, we will, we can get to that if people have questions. Um, Rust enforces a pit of success. Uh, a lot of people struggle to learn Rust because getting your first program to compile can feel like pulling teeth. Uh, you can also get fairly into a program that you're writing and like, hey, this is how I write it in C++. And then suddenly the compiler starts yelling at you and you can't get it to stop. 99% of the time the compiler is right. You are writing code in a fundamentally unsafe way. You are writing code in a paradigm that makes it hard for the safety guarantees to enforce. You're trying to access global static data from multiple threads and the Rust compiler is trying to prevent you from shooting yourself in the foot. Um, but if you try to write Rust code like you would write C, like you would write C++, you're in for a very bad time. Rust kind of has its own style that it wants you to write things in, which is a fundamentally uh, memory safe style. Um, Rust talks a lot about the pit of success, which is like the easiest way to write a program should be the most right way to write it. You shouldn't have to jump through extra hoops to get safety or reliability or other things. Um, but if you're not used to that, you're not used to the Rust way of doing things, uh, it can be uh, a bear to start with. Um, so here's the, the first actual Rust code we're going to look at. This is very, very basic Rust syntax. It will feel very familiar if you're used to C++. So we, we started at the very top with function main. That's exactly what you think it would be. Uh, there are ways to get to the command line arguments, but they don't come as arguments to the main function. Um, actually, before your main function is called, there's a little bit of standard library runtime that is run, which, which deals with interfacing with the runtime. And then there's a standard library function you can use to get command line arguments. You can optionally return various return types from main. Uh, if you want to, like you can return an integer and that will be bubbled up as a POSIX code, but Rust actually will let you return a result, which is their er error type and, and do nice handling for you to, to interact with different operating systems. Uh, sorry, one thing I didn't mention in sort of the history of Rust is Rust targets everything. Um, if you're familiar with LLVM and what LLVM can compile to, Rust supports all targets that LLVM can compile to, which means you can compile to Linux, Mac, Windows, WebAssembly, whole families of microcontrollers, um, Rust, uh, whole families of like specialized runtime areas, Rust will literally go, you know, silicon to cloud, um, the, the full state span. Um, okay, finally, uh, bubbling down, um, you're, there's a for loop for in the list of values. At the, the, at the first line, we're creating a list of uh, integers. Um, the vec thing there, vec exclamation part, is a macro that we're invoking that is initializing a vector for us. Um, the mute on let mute values is saying we want this va va uh, variable to be editable. 
By default, if you just say let some variable name in Rust, the default is it is an immutable constant data. So the default in Rust is const. You have to choose to make a thing mutable to choose to make it riskier. The safest thing is the easiest thing. Um, the for loop here for value in and values, the and sign there is taking a reference, just like you would take a reference in C++. And that means we are iterating through the values in that list by referencing the memory in that list, not by making a copy of it. So within the context of that for statement, um, value is, is just pointing at the memory um, for each iteration. Uh, print line there is another macro that's kind of showing uh, Rust's print statement. There's a few different ways of printing in Rust. Um, normally, you don't use print line. You use log macros, but this is the basics. This is the hello world of it. Uh, if statements exactly work exactly how you'd expect them to uh, from any language, there is nothing magic about if statements at all. Rust uh, kind of hates parentheses, though, like no unnecessary syntax. So you'll see parentheses only were absolutely required. And the vast majority of parentheses relate to, to function calls. Um, we then get to this kind of crazy thing, which is the match statement. Um, this is very similar to the switch statement from C++, but oh my god, more powerful. Like kind of absurdly powerful and one of the like cornerstone features of the language. As we get to structs and enums, you will see why. But you can do all kinds of rules in match statements. Um, one rule that Rust has is that all match statements must be provably by the compiler um, spanning all possible inputs. Meaning if the compiler can't check and know at compile time that you've covered every case for the data that you're matching on, you have to include that very bottom case underscore case uh, for a default case if it didn't match against anything else. Um, but the compiler is very smart about knowing whether you have to do that default case uh, most of the time. Um, at the very bottom here, we are now doing while let some value equals values dot pop. Uh, this is more Rust, Rust magic here. Um, values dot pop is uh, popping an item off of the in front of the vector and making that item free. It is shortening the vector and doing it. Um, that is an operation that could fail. Um, there might not be an item. So the while let some syntax there is saying while I can successfully convert the result of what pop gave me into a value, which is kind of a funny syntax. Sorry, I just heard the notification that someone wants to join the meet, so I will add them and we're back. Uh, okay, we're back. Um, and more printing. Uh, that's just a giant pile of all of the syntax in Rust. Questions there? What's on line 25? Line 25, uh, that's VS Code um, telling me that's the end of that parentheses. Um, anything that's in a gray box here is actually not uh, things that I'm typing. That is VS Code providing type hints for me. Um, Rust, you don't have to specify the type most of the time. Sometimes you do when the compiler can't determine it for you. But anytime where it is obvious what the return type should be, the you don't have to specify it. Um, but it is very handy to know what the return type is. I left the type hints in from VS Code to, to make it easier here. Um, here's uh, slightly more syntax. Yep, question. Uh, so if you go back to that last while, let some value, um, could you add potentially some condition on the value, like value greater than three or something? Is that, is that, it does, does that some come with that? capability or yes it does and we will get to that um those are those are car called match guards and i will show a match guard a little later so the while loop is that like a soft try catch where there was like where if there was no value pop would, yes the while loop will end so this while loop will pop each value off the right. vector in the last yeah. case it won't match and code execution will continue on but is there some i mean is there some built-in language intrinsic, intrinsic like try and catch to say that if I don't have anything on my back? Great, I great question. Can I do my error in? Um, Rust is extremely opinionated about how to handle errors. And its opinion is that all error handling should be done in the return value from the function. We will get to it a little bit later on, on more how to do it, but Rust does not do exceptions. Exceptions violate control flow laws in language and makes things super hard to prove that you're following it correctly. So you would you would do syntax like that in Rust with an if statement and with match guards in an if statement where like um, there is no there is no try catch equivalent, 
um, you you get a result returned and then you match on that result to do error handling. Well, yeah. On your first loop there, would we be seeing the uh, values or the addresses? You would be seeing the uh, values themselves. Uh, themselves yeah. Um, and that is that is just uh, by definition of what the print macro does. If you pass a reference into the print macro, it will by default unpack that reference to the value. Um, there is syntax you could put in between these braces on line five to say how you wanted that that variable to be printed right. that lets you do things like actually print the memory address. Right. So because of that answer and also <laughs> because of line 22 there, um, yeah. does that mean that objects don't have but you can't test an object as null. Oh, there, there is no null. There is a, we're gonna get there. We're gonna get there. We're gonna get there. We're gonna get there. There is. I love Rust for this. Okay. Uh, I love these questions too. Thank you guys. Uh, here's just a little bit more syntax to show sort of how functions work. Um, uh, at the top, we're declaring a function. I'm calling it square. It's taking in a single argument. The type of that argument is float 64. The return type, that arrow to the right, f64, is how it how it specifies the return type. So. The basic operation here is I can say return x times x. There's, there's a very basic square function. Here's what it looks like in main to actually call that function. I'm saying let result equals call the function square with the value two, and then I'm printing it out. Um, one thing that Rust does let you do though is that it has a very clear definition in the language of the difference between a statement and an expression. Um, if something uh, returns a value, it's an expression. If it doesn't return a value, it's a statement. Um, if a function ends with a line that is a expression that is evaluable, it just takes that as the return type. So I don't actually have to write return x times x semicolon and make it a um, statement. I can just say x times x and, and Rust will automatically bubble up that as the return type of the function. Can you add a colon to that line? Can I add a colon to what line? Line six on the bottom. Yes, if I wanted to specify and force what I wanted the return type to be, I could, and then it would warn me if they if it would fail to compile if those types didn't match. Um, there is also some types that do automatic type coercion, but Rust really tries to avoid automatic type coercion in almost all circumstances, and wants you to explicitly convert between types. All right. So so far, all of your assignments have been online. Yep. Is that all? Is that required to do an assignment, or is that? Every single time I'm declaring a new right. variable and assigning it. You are not allowed to declare a variable without assigning it. So a variable must be assigned oh, when it is declared. Um, if you, so if it's not a mutable variable, they, that's how the assignment happens with the blip, but if yep. it's a mutable variable, you can have a secondary line somewhere else. And, and then reassign later. Yep, exactly right. Um, you can also, and this is a, a common style in Rust, because it sucks to, if you want a bunch of intermediate results, to keep creating new variable names. If I said let num equals five, and then on the next line I did let num equals four, that second one changes the immutable variable by re-declaring it. Um, and that still lets the language track it. Like you have to have the let statement. Sorry, that was probably uh, a, a caveat for slightly later in it, but you can reuse variable names um, to, to deal with how strict it is about immutable um, stuff. And it, it there's you can change type that way too. You could have a so you have two different branches that are defining mutable variables. The compiler has to tell if it's which one of those is being used. You can't access those outside of those contexts, right? Those branches have yeah, to yeah, converge back. Yep, yep. It's the, it's the Haskell concept of being uh, not having side effects. Yes, yes. Um, uh, so here's some examples of, of like expressions versus statements. Um, on the first line, I am doing a statement. Uh, the statement ends with a semicolon, and that means there is no remaining value that is that is existing after that. So, a de declaration of a variable with an assignment, there's nothing left over after that 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 I could assign to. So, if I try to say let also num equals let num equals five, uh, I get a compile error because I'm attempting to assign nothing to to that variable. Um, I can do kind of fancy stuff here where I can say let sign equals if num greater than zero positive else negative. Um, this will work only if all branches uh, return the same type. 
Um, but you can also do this in match statements here where I can have multiple branches here and I can assign an entire match statement. I don't need any return logic. I don't need any um, parentheses and none of these lines end with semicolons if they are bubbling that variable up. So a statement ends with a semicolon, an expression ends with uh, nothing and that is then just, just bubbled up. It looks a little funky. You get used to it uh, very quickly. So was it the normal match statement? didn't have semicolons after each case? Uh, if if it, it has semicolons after each case, if if it's, uh, we'll, we'll rewind back. It has it, uh, oh, there's, there's commas here. Print line is already a statement. Print line returns nothing. You don't have to do the semicolons if Rust is, is smart enough about doing it. The compiler tries to help you as much as you can. The, there is a semicolon at the end of the match statements. Otherwise, if I didn't put the semicolon at the end of the match statement, the compiler might be confused and try to return the result of print line as the return result of main. Um, so the semicolon says like, stop bubbling up this return type. Um, and to Sanad's question earlier, here's a match statement where I'm saying matching and then there's an if num greater than zero, that is a match guard. That exact syntax could have been used after the um, uh, while let sum in the, in the previous example. Um, I'm going to cover arrays and vectors very quickly. Um, arrays are exactly like you would imagine an array in C is. Um, it is fixed length. Its length is part of its type when it is created. Um, there are compile time safe checks on array length then if you are using a fixed length array where everything is enforced at compile time. The brace operator indexes into the array to get a value out of it um, and uh, will, will be compile time checked for length. Questions there. On on line six, it's taking the i from zero to four. Is 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 it going to stop at three, or does it? Do I get it? Uh, it will stop at three. If I did dot dot equals, it would have continued up. So if you actually look on line sixteen here, here is two two ten inclusive. Okay. Yeah. Um, and that's Rust's range syntax. Um, good questions, guys. I'm just throwing all the syntax up. If I did sort of ask question I thought you were asking. Uh, how does it deal with overflowing the bounds of the array? Fully compile time check. So would this not compile? This will compile because that is an exclusive range zero to three. If I put if I put a five in there, it would compile time catch that this while loop will exceed the bounds of uh, this array. Are there negative indices on the array like past negative <laughs> Absolutely not. Yeah. <laughs> Don't do that. Um, Ru so Rust has a higher level concept for, for doing weird things with stuff called iterators. Um, very similar to iterators in Python, you would create a reverse iterator. And then there are all of these ways to chain iterators and do, do higher level iterator functions. I don't have any of that sort of prepared for tonight, but um, if, you, if you look into iterators at Rust, there's a very easy way to iterate through anything that is iterable backwards. Um, vectors are equivalent to arrays, um, except uh, they are variable in size. They are automatically heap allocated. Um, we won't talk too much about constructors yet, but first line here is creating a mutable vector with vec new. New is nothing special. New is just some function that exists which will return to me a vector. Um, uh, so there's no nothing special about a function being named new, but it is the Rust convention for most types to have a new which is their default constructor. But there are a lot of types in Rust that you can't construct directly. Um, a very common concept in Rust is to do like a state machine where I have a type that represents a connection attempt. I do that attempt, it returns a type which is the connection state and I can't actually get a connection without having gone through the connection attempt as the way to construct it. Sorry, that's a little a little messy in there, but um, uh, we're constructing a, a type here, and there's there's nothing special about the fact that um, the it's named new. Was there a question? Okay, uh, because uh, vec is v is mutable, then I can call push. Push is a function that will only be uh, accessible on a mutable um, version of v. We'll get into mutability a little bit more when we when we talk about structs later. Um, vectors do have both a brace operator and a get operator. The brace operator uh, will panic if it goes out of bounds. Sorry, I wrote panis. Um, uh, panic uh, is, is Rust's closest equivalent to an exception. 
Um, and it's saying, I have reached a state in the program where it is impossible for me to make forward progress safely, and you can create your own panic handler. Um, the default panic handler for most targets will print out to standard error and return to the operating system with a failure. Um, but you can do all kinds of custom panic handlers if you want to, not recommended. Um, panicking is not what you are supposed to do. What you are supposed to do is the next line, which is the get function. Um, get here returns uh, an option, which is how Rust represents nullable types. Option is the first enum that we will encounter. Option can either be none or some. When we went back to the previous line with that if let sum, we were actually taking an enum and we were downcasting that enum to one of the variants of that enum, the, e the variant sum, which does contain the value and then we can access the value in it. Um, we'll get to enums in more detail in a little bit. Uh, I have um, a question about the panic, panicking. Um, how is that different from an exception? It, it sounds very much alike. Uh, there is only one global panic handler, and there is only one place where panics can go instead of you being able to mix and match panics in different places and do different different rules with it. Um, when you get into things like asynchronous code in Rust and multi-threaded code in Rust, you can do some control over like if one thread panics, should that panic the other threads in your application or not to decide how you want to clean up multi-threaded code but it's not perfect. Um, panic is really only, it's one of those things that like whenever Rust deals with something that it can't handle safely, that's the final straw of what you can do. And uh, if you write code that panics a lot, the Rust uh, ecosystem will come and slap you around and, and try to avoid it. Like pan the, the panicking behavior is, is what, we, what we don't, if we wanted panicking, we would write in a different language. It's the same. It's the same. Well, yeah, yeah. Basically, like you're done with it. Yeah. Um, yep. Yeah, uh, I will just briefly, actually, here, click on a documentation link, um, just to show how awesome uh, Rust's documentation is. Um, baked into Rust is a way to write documentation comments, a lot like Doxygen, um, that generates documentation. There is a website called docs.rs that hosts all documentation for all crates uploaded to Rust's package ecosystem. All of the documentation is in a completely consistent format that is beautiful and it's, it's dense and hard to understand, but I would say exceptionally well written. Um, and my God, RTFM, the manual is so good. Uh, they explain a lot, and it will get into every function here, how that function works, what the signature of that function is, examples of using the function. The standard library in particular is immaculate, but I would say Rust crates in general have excellent documentation, um, and they should be praised for that. Uh, okay, uh, impl blocks now. We're going we're gonna to start getting into uh, this is the object-oriented programming that does exist in Rust, um, and I'm showing a struct for the first time. So uh, at the very top of this example, I am saying there is going to be a struct. That's the closest thing. I guess it's a struct in C. There is no class equivalent. Everything is either a struct or an enum. Those are the two fundamental types um, that are customizable in Rust. Um, this struct will have two values in it, one named value, which is a 64-bit floating point, one named unit, which is a string. Um, I will say here, there are a lot of people get confused by string in Rust. We'll cover it a little bit more later. But capital S string is a heap allocated string of variable length. You will see lowercase str stir. That is a fixed array slice of a chunk of memory that contains characters. Um, so I, what? 32 bits. 8 bits or 32 bits. Aha, uh -huh, UTF-8. <laughs> Um, and it, so strings in Rust by default are, are, are UTF and uh, Unicode, yeah, yep. Um, and yes, yes. <laughs> um, but it means questions like how many bits and questions about what is a character get very annoying answers. And unfortunately, um, Rust internal string handling is great. Rust has a separate type for operating system string that you need to deal with when you translate from strings from the operating system because the different operating systems out there deal with strings differently and Rust tries to be very, very correct about those things. Um, but sorry, sorry, 
Ron Strucks. Ron Strucks. I can I can rabbit hole really quickly. How are we doing on time? Oh my God, we're so behind. It's fine. Um, okay, so impl block here. Impl means implementation. I'm doing an implementation here of num with units. Normally, impl blocks have a lot more in their header where I, they say, I am implementing this trait for this type under these circumstances. There's a lot that can go into an impl um, block header. Right now, I'm simply saying I'm implementing num with units. These are just base functions that will exist on this type. And I, I, I'm creating functions for this type. The first one I'm doing here is my own constructor for it. I'm declaring, here's the syntax I want for a structor. I'm going to constructor. I'm going to take in a value. I'm going to take in a unit. I'm going to return a num with units. This is an infallible constructor where I say, and right now saying, regardless of what string you hand me for unit, I'm going to go ahead and construct one of these in hand back. Um, this lower syntax that's in here, where I'm saying num with units brace brace, that is the low level struct initializer, where I'm creating an instance of that struct, and I am and I am actually putting values in it. When you use this lower level struct initializer syntax, um, you have to assign every variable inside it. Right now, I'm using a shorthand syntax here, where because these variable names match the names of the variables inside the struct, I don't actually have to say value equals value, unit equals unit. It will automatically infer that for me. This uh, brace initializer syntax by default for most types is a hidden part of that type's private API. So most types that you interact with you can't directly use this brace initializer syntax, but the library author can, and they create their constructors with whatever guards they want on their constructors for it. Pause there. And you have multiple info blocks for a single struct? Yes. And they can be behind compile time guards and features and contained in different modules, so you can include different ones at different times. Um, you can also, uh, this, is, this is kind of a, a weird thing, uh, Oh, I'm not going to get into it. Never mind. Uh, <laughs> you're you're not allowed to define an impl block for a type that isn't owned by your crate, but you can wrap a type that someone else created in a type that is simply a wrapper of that, and then define implementations for that. And then there's a way for people who include your crate to bring those implementations into scope if they want to use them. So there are ways to extend classes that other libraries write, but it's it's kind of interesting. Um, it is, it is opt-in very safe. You can't like accidentally add an include statement to one of your packages and have it fuck up a type by replacing um, the function, which I've had happen in C++ before. Um, so there's no encapsulation, right? Am I, am I reading this right? You need to define encapsulation for me. There's no, uh, there's no privacy to the variables inside the structure. Any, any bit of code we can access through. Okay, we're, we're going to get into modules and crates a little bit right now. Um, by default, the visibility of the members within a struct are constrained to the same module, meaning the same uh, file effectively. There is a way to break a module across multiple files, but I'm in the same file in which um, num with units is declared. That means I have free access to its values. I can put pub in front of this to make it public for other people who include my module. I can put pub crate so it can be visible to other modules within my same crate, which is the name for like an overall package, but not then to people who include my crate. So uh, it gets visibility gets messy. Yeah, file will stay. Yeah. And then the, the, defining multiple implementations, so they have to be behind compile guards? Or is this a attempt at fun? No, no, no. Um, you, you, you can just have them in multiple places, although I think most people would consider that bad Rust style. Um, you might even get a compiler warning that you have like two implementation blocks in the same okay. module that aren't like, why, why would you not group them together if there's not some reason to separate them out right. because of. Because yes. Yeah. Yep. So then if there's no polymorphism, that means there's no inheritance. There's a shitload of polymorphism in inheritance, okay. but they come through traits. They do not come through this mechanism. Okay. Um, and so, so just to give a quick hint on it, Sorry. we'll cover it next time it's good. Um, I would define a trait, and that trait would have a, it's, it's equivalent to an abstract interface in Java or a class in C++ that only had abstract methods. So I say this trait has this list of functions that this trait provides, and then I would say impl this trait for num with units. To provide an implementation of that trait for this type. It's yep. And there's only inheritance operations, which is the proper way to do that. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. You got it. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, and there's there's ways to template all of that and automatically implement interfaces on types, which implement other interfaces. And oh, it gets very fun. Next 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 class. <laughs> um, Diving in a little bit now, we have function set value. Um, so the first interesting thing, this is what would be called a member function in another language. Um, we don't treat functions special um, in any way. They, they all explicitly state their arguments. Saying and mute self here says that this, this function is taking a mutable reference to the object that it's being called on and is then allowed to edit value. The only way I'm allowed to assign to value here is because I have a mutable reference into the object that you're calling this on to actually be able to edit it. Um, so that's what the difference between like new here is a static function. I don't actually need a num with units object initialized to call that function. Any function that takes self in any form, uh, uh, I have to have one first. And so here's here's basic syntax at the bottom of, of calling that. Good? Sweet. Uh, we're now gonna get into enums. Um, enums are, I would say, one of the biggest magic sauces of Rust that allow it to have an incredibly rich type system and, and enforce these complex ideas of interfaces. So enums start off looking exactly like an enum in C. I can define individual cases within the enums, which, which some people call discriminants. I call cases because I have trouble saying the word discriminant. Um, and I can do a match statement on these where I say match a, a length unit and then have a case for each one of meters, feet, inches, and centimeters. The compiler would know if I wrote a match statement that only covered some of those cases, I could use the default case to lump some of them together. That all makes a ton of sense. That's all very easy. But suddenly we get down to unit here, or actually let's go to, let's go to, yeah, let's go to unit here. I'm saying there is a case of this called time, in which case it contains a time unit. Otherwise, there is a case of it called length, in which case it contains a length unit. If you have ever worked with unions in C, where the memory can be directly laying on top of each other, this is fusing together the concept of a union with the concept of an enum where we're allowing unions, we're allowing this one chunk of memory to either be one thing or another thing, but the only way to access one of those is through a match statement on the enum case. Um, so if you do a union, the union has to travel with its discriminant that allows you to know which case of the union is active at a given time. I see some puzzled faces. I will answer questions there. Uh, I'm familiar with Java enums where the order matters. Is there a concept of associating on a specific number? Yep. It's it's completely optional. You can put numbers, you can I think put characters and do letters. You can you can write some very expressive types in Rust that allow like automatic serialization and parsing to work very well. Um, so so you can set values um, to the to the value that the discriminant must be when the discriminant represents that that case, um, if that makes sense. Um, that does not affect the value that the underlying discriminant will hold as its as its sort of child. Sorry, the lang language is hard here, guys. Um, but looking down here at these let statements, then, and again, remembering that these are these are type ends. So I can say let unit equals length unit centimeters. I've, I've just declared unit is now of type length units, and it is its value is the discriminant centimeters. It, it, that is the the data that it contains. But I can say let generic unit here equals unit colon colon length, and then I can tell, I have to tell, it will not let me construct a length unit without assigning what value is inside that length unit. I'm assigning length unit centimeters. It likes that, it's happy with that. Down here though, if I try to put a time unit inside a length unit, it gets mad at me and says that like, those don't match. I can't, that, 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 that data doesn't fit inside this case of the enum. Um, where this stuff like this can be super useful is like I use this little enum case here of like JSON value. I can have a string, I can have a number, I can have a boolean, I can discriminate between which one of those it is at any given time, and I can put those data inside it in the same place. Um, one warning to have here, just for people to be aware of, the size of your enum, just like a union in C, will be the size of the largest case of it. So if you have, if one of, if this was string number boolean and 10,000 entry array, every single one of these JSON values would take up enough space to hold 10,000 entry array in memory when I used it. 
Um, but you can of course use like a pointer instead and there's there's pointers and boxes and yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, so here's actually now using the match statement to unpack that enum, to access the data inside that enum. Um, the only way that Rust will let me get to the data contained within the case of the enum is with some kind of pattern matching. Um, match statements are the most common way and the easiest way to sort of see it happen, but there is also if let and while let and some of these some of these other ways if you want to specifically unpack only one case of the enum instead of writing code that is intentionally handling all cases of it. Um, but that's this would be an example of a function which takes in the unit um, and converts it to uh, a, a and static stir here. That is a reference to static data because it's referencing actually the hard coded data that's existing in here. We're going to get to lifetimes at the very end. That colon that that uh, what is that apostrophe? No, no, the tick. The tick. Tick static is a okay. lifetime, which is the, the the very cool feature of Rust that solves all the data race craziness. I'm sorry. Any questions on the match statement? Why is the time units different from the length units? Um, I showed two different examples. Sorry, here. Um, I, I should I should have addressed that. Um, in the first instance here for time, I am unpacking time to inner time. Now, on the right side of this sort of arrow syntax here, inner time is now a defined variable and has unpacked time units. Now I can match on inner time to access the inside cases of that. And I'm doing chained match statements there. I'm doing a match statement inside a match statement. You can also, though, uh, this pattern matching syntax that Rust can do is insanely powerful and can do some very complex things. So I am now here double unpacking the stacked enums in one go. And like this branch will only be hit if it is both of length and of meters with that. Um, to sort of go on to the next slide then, there's crazy shit you can do with match statements, with or expressions and ranges, and all kinds of, of, of funky shit in them. Um, this even doesn't doesn't show the, the hell of it, but um, I think I have this this top example here is actually a chunk of code from the library I've written. Ross Lebrus, actually, I think Shane wrote this chunk specifically. Um, I am iterating through uh, data, and this is um, uh, you know just a, a file I've loaded. I'm interpreting it as a string. I'm for each line. Enumerate here is then expanding that iterator. So I'm getting a tuple of both the side, the line number and the actual data in that line. So that's that's some of that inter iterator syntax I was saying before. I'm saying data. I'm saying I'm looking at that data as a string. Lines is turning it into an iterator, which will iterate through each lines. And then enumerate is tagging each of those iterations with the line number. So I can track the line number as well. I am then matching on a tuple of finding this particular character set and finding this particular character set. In Ross service message definition files, this dash 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 symbol separates out the request type from the response type. This uh, pound symbol represents a comment. And now I'm handling the cases of this first case will match if I, if I have, if I, find both of the things I went to look for in that line, and then I do an if statement on which came first. This case will match if I found the first one, I found the dot, 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 but didn't find the pound symbol, and this case will match if neither of them were found. That's fucking cool. I'm sorry. Like, um, it's it's a very clean, it's it's kind of a weird syntax to get used to, once you start using it, like, holy shit, this pattern matching represents a lot of higher level data logic flow in, in very condensed lines. So basically say on the right, can this data be interpreted as this data on the left? Um, there's a little syntax here where I'm saying some underscore there. That's saying like some does contain a value. I'm not going to use that value in the body of this. I'm giving it no name. I'm, um, so I don't actually care about the name. I'm not going to. I'm not going to reference the data. We never use that data in this instance of the case statement. Um, there's also breaks for the for loop to exit the for loop. Um, there's also one of the things I don't love about Rust, but it turns out to be super useful. Um, you can name uh, loops and you can give breaks uh, a loop to break out to. 
um, which I find very useful. It feels a little bit like a ghost go-to statement, but but you can specify how deeply out to break when you have nested loops. God damn, that's convenient sometimes. It feels dirty still though. Okay, so we're now gonna talk about option result, which we, we've teased a little bit and we've dealt with, with a tiny bit. Option and result are the two enums baked into the standard library that are by far the most used. Option is used anywhere in the language where data can be nullable. If I want nullable data, I wrap the data I want in the type option, which is now an enum, which it will either be not the data none, or the case some, there is some data there and it will contain the inner type. This is literally the standard library definition of option. It's that easy. This is also our first peek at templating. So I'm saying enum option templated on any type T. Um, and that's a, that's very similar to C++ templates. Um, where it works very well. G generic, yeah. Uh, I, I will call it templates. The, the language calls it generics. I'm sorry, I'm a C++ guy. Um, result then is how the language handles all error handling. Um, result is I will either get back the type that I requested, otherwise I will get back error as a type and error will be some type defined by that function. Um, there are standard conventions in the, the libraries and ecosystem on what error types are and how to nicely handle error types, but not everybody can use a generic error type where that error type say contains a variable length string. If, if the, we required that the error type contain a variable length string, uh, you could never use it on a microcontroller without a heap. Um, so, so the error type that is fundamental to Rust is as generic as you will return OK or you will return error, and error will be of some type. The only restriction that the language puts on error is that error has to be printable. Mm -hmm. um, and there is a two-string function that must exist on error, but that's the only one that the, the standard library imposes. Um, over here on the left, we're doing let vec equals whatever. We got a vec. Now when I call vec get, I'm actually having it show the, the return type of that. And it, in this case, with getting zero, it will return some zero. Will be, it will be the, the actual thing that is handed back to me. If I access out of bounds, it will now return the none case of it. Um, down here is actually I'm using the standard library function to parse a number from a string. Um, I mentioned earlier that uh, when the compiler can know the, the type that you want, you don't have to specify the type. It will do type inference. In this case, the compiler doesn't know without me writing some extra syntax whether I am parsing that string into an integer, into a float, into something else. I actually have two options for where I could provide it that type information. One option is on the left side here where I could type out what Visual Studio Code put would, put there for me, which is colon result f32 comma parse float error. Um, that, is, that is one option. The other option is this syntax on the right where I'm saying colon, colon, and then I'm specifying the template that I want you to use with parse because parse is a templated function and I'm specifying this is the type I'd like to call parse with. And then that's all I have to tell the compiler for it to then work out what the full return type is. So here then is I'm putting that, that enum into a match statement to do error handling and it, handling the error case and handling the value case of it with the different types. Um, I will say this match state style is what you should use when you start with the language. It is by far the easiest to understand. It is by far the easiest to work with correctly, um, but it's kind of verbose. There are a lot of shorthands for error handling in Rust with this like question mark operator, with this unwrap, unwrap or else, try unwrap. There's a bunch of shorthands for, for, hey, you gave me an option or result and I'd like to take the value out or bubble the error up. Um, uh, you don't have to write out the full match statement every time, but I encourage you to write out the full match statement as you're learning the language because it, it shows you some of the magic that's happening in there. Okay, time check. God damn, we're gonna, if, if people are okay running late, we're gonna run late because I wanna get through references, lifetimes, and fire checker. Um, I should have known, I should have known that it was over ambitious, <laughs> but I'm excited. Okay, uh, by default, most of the types we've been looking for at so far are copy types. Copy types, are types that the language specifies 
this is free to copy around. It is, it is easier to copy this data than it is to move the data and take ownership of it or pass it around it. They are for what in, in C++ is often called pod types, plain old data, um, the, the integral types. Um, you don't implement copy on types typically. Um, it's all auto implemented by the compiler when the compiler knows that type should be copy. Um, types that are copy, you can use multiple times freely and the compiler will automatically um, make copies of that type for you. So example three here, I say x equals one, I then assign x to y, and then I do use x again, let z equals x plus one. I've used x twice there and it just freely made a copy of the value of x and assigned a copy of the value of x to y. And then on this line, it made a copy of X and assigned a copy of the value to Z. So when you're working with basic data types like that, the compiler is just putting make a copy of in there for you automatically. The first type that most people um, encounter that is not a copy type is a string. Um, strings are uh, heap allocated. We already talked about that a little bit. This first line here, I'm saying X equals hello dot two string um, the, the string literal in Rust is not a string. If you, I type a string literal, it's not heap allocated. That's, that's static data. So on that static data, I'm saying to string to turn it into the capital S string type. I then assign Y to X. That moves ownership of X to Y. The variable Y now controls the lifetime of the data that X pointed to. Usage of X is now no longer valid. And when Y is deallocated, the memory that Y owns will be released. So this is RAII. RAII is just baked into Rust. Resource acquisition is initialization. It cares about that. We move ownership through the language. And when ownership moves, whenever the, own, the thing who owns it is deallocated, that's when that memory is freed. So you have to deal with ownership carefully as soon as you start dealing with it. So Right here, I don't actually care about owning X. When I'm saying Z equals X plus world here, I don't actually want to take ownership of X. Um, what I want to use is I want to use the data that X points at. This is where we, we get into references. Um, I will also say, holy living shit, does the Rust compiler have the best error messages you have ever seen by like an absurd value. Eventually you will break it. You go deep enough in the type system, you will get template hell out of it. It is so much harder to, and it's, it's default error messages are mwah, so good. So look at this. The error at the bottom value used here after it's moved. Uh, value is moved here. Why was the value moved here? Move occurs because X has type string, which does not implement the copy trait. Oh, it told us exactly what went wrong there. Um, so there are two ways of fixing this problem. The first way is to explicitly copy the data. Um, dot clone is the, is the way in the language that is the standard um, library trait to say, I want to make a copy of this data I call dot clone. There are types which don't have clone implemented for them. Like I'm not allowed to clone a socket connection. I have to make a new socket. I can't clone um, just the data that that socket connection points to because that would screw a lot of things up. Um, so in this case, I make a full copy of Y and then I'm allowed to use Z here and Z moves ownership of that string that, that X had. And when Z is deallocated now, um, it frees the memory. X is invalid after that line. So that is the Y. In, so this, in, in a C world, Y would be getting a pointer to X. And now if you changed X where you concatenated something, you, that will be a new object with a new pointer. So if they the pointer in my would be In the top example or the bottom? Yeah, the top. In the top example here, I clone a new copy of X onto the heap oh, and okay. I give Y a pointer to the new heap location of that copy. Got it. So you can never end up in a situation like that. All right, but then down below you're doing the references. Yes. So now I say Y equals a reference to X. Y doesn't own that data now. That's completely valid. Y is more than anything else an alias. It is another name for that same data. I like to think of references as that. It is another variable name in the program that points to that same data. Under the hood, it might actually all be pointers, but we don't need to know that. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, the compiler, oftentimes there won't even be a pointer involved because the compiler is smart enough to know I'm just using an alias of that variable name and the pointer actually disappears. So 
Um, sorry, so Y points to the same memory that X has, and I'm now allowed to transfer ownership of X to Z, and Y is still completely happy in this case because Z, the ownership has been transferred to the name Z, but it's still the same data. Y still points to the same location. So Y becomes Hello World. Um, y becomes Hello World, not Hello. Shane? Uh, no, because uh, once you move to Z, uh, the operation plus will create a new uh, string for you, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> right, so, so it's actually Y and Z instead of Y being X. <laughs> in this case, Y, is, this is, sorry, this is this I mean, is a poor true. example. What actually ends up here, and this is this is my fault, is that the plus operator, I think, is actually making a copy of X yeah. and, and returning a, a copy of the string with the data connect, connect, concatenated with, to it, but. Um, X is gone, Y exists. Yep. All right, so then that means that yeah. in order to get the behavior you expect for passing strings and functions, you have to pass all these basic references. There are other ways, but generally, yes. Well, because if you're passing it on the stack, then you have a high potential for both overflows. And the idea was that the default way is the safest way, so. Yes, so if I pass it into a function, that function now owns that variable. And when that function ends, the memory is deallocated. So if I call a function without as a reference, that function takes ownership of the data. So a really good way of that is I want to make a socket, I, I have a socket connection attempt I'm gonna turn that into a, so uh, a socket by calling the connect function. The connect function doesn't take a reference to self. It actually takes self, owns the previous data, uses it, copies whatever it wants out of that data and then deallocates it. And so a function which like takes self, uh, the, it, that it type is guaranteed to be deallocated when that function returns, unless that function returns part of that memory out of it or, or there are other ways to do it. But calling a function which takes ownership means that function then owns that data. So there is no pass by values. You pass ownership. You pass by ownership or you pass by reference. Um, or you you make you can you can pass by value by making a copy. The only way to pass right. by value is to choose to make a copy. And that's how Rust enforces all of these memory safeties. Like like this is the root of why Rust ends up a fundamentally safer, fundamentally more expressive language. Um, immediate thing to know about references. Okay, we're taking references to data. Rust imposes an incredibly strict restriction um, right off of the get-go. So you are allowed to have as many immutable references to a piece of data as you want. You can look at that data from as many locations in the program as you like. You can read from that data from multiple threads. We guarantee that is safe. You can never have multiple mutable references to a variable. There can never be two names in the program which can modify the same piece of data at the same time, because then we can't enforce uh, race conditions and safety guarantees around that. There are ways around this, which is like there's a mutex type, and the mutex type lets you do that. And the mutex type lets you do that by building a mutex and using a little bit of unsafe code that they've checked with the operating system. We know the mutex is handling this uh, correctly, but by default, you can't edit data from the same two locations in Rust ever at all. There is another extension to that, you can't take a mutable reference to data for which an immutable reference also exists. So if someone is able to read from that data, you can't write that data while someone else could be looking at it because that can be a race condition. They could look at it partway through a write and everything could break. Um, so that's very restrictive. Uh, but again, the Rust compiler will check it for you very, very, very well and tell you what you're doing wrong. Questions there? So, did you? Uh, so, so what's going on with borrowing here? What's going on with borrowing? Um, yeah, yeah. So, on, yeah, yeah. The, the comment on the bottom: you cannot borrow X. So, uh, uh, Rust's name for taking a reference is borrowing. <laughs> Sorry, that's that's just the name that they decided to to use. So there's there's the mutable x, yep. and then y is borrowing the mutable x. Does that mean x is no longer usable? X still owns the data. When x is deallocated, the lifetime of x is tied to the lifetime of the string, and when x goes out of scope, the memory goes away. 
Mm -hmm. Y is not borrow is not owning the value. Y's lifetime does not enforce that that variable stays alive, but Y is peeking at the data. Y, y has the ability to look at it and the ability to edit it in this case because it's immutable borrow, but Y's lifetime doesn't mean anything for when that value gets created or destroyed. So while Y is able to, like while Y exists, is, is X still usable during that time? Yes, but not mutably. <laughs> okay. So when I, if we wind back to uh, the, the function, where was my struct example? We're close. Did I go past? I went past it. Set value here. So I'm calling a function. Set value takes a mutable reference on self. I couldn't call set value on X because calling that function would take a mutable reference and I can't have two mutable references. So when I tried to call that function on X, it would say you can't have two mutable references at the same time. So if I tried to mutate X at all, Y, Y had a mutable reference, it would get mad at me, but I could still do other things with X. Um, I think I have an example here, uh, slightly further on do I, where I drop it. No, I don't have a drop example. We'll, we'll get to it. Slightly. All right. So you may not be able to answer this, or want to answer this because of time. Yep. Uh, does this mean that locking is being implemented under the covers, but it can only reason about one thing, or is it saying the compiler is saying there will never be a collision because of the way that this code is constructed? The compiler is saying there will never be a collision because of the way the code is constructed, and it enforces that through a mechanism called lifetimes. So there is a thing called the borrow checker, which the compiler will run at compile time and will prove about your program before it allows it to compile that there are never two mutable references to the same piece of data. Oh! <laughs> Entire reason the language exists. I thought you close that. Yeah. It's so good. It's so good. We'll get there. We'll get there. I told us it couldn't be that sweet. <laughs> yes. Um, so uh, we're going we're gonna to prove it right here. We're going to try to do this. I want to, uh, I actually pulled right here um, the example of push stir from the standard library. That is the entire implementation of push stir from the standard library, which takes a mutable reference to self. It takes a reference to the uh, data you want to push onto it, and it calls uh, self dot its internal vector that it has extend from slice, which reallocates that vector bigger with sufficient space, and then puts those bytes into that vector. Um, here's an example. Example six here is I think exactly what Jim was asking about earlier. I have mutable X, I take a mutable reference to it, and then I try to call X dot push stir. X dot push stir would take a mutable reference to it. I say first mutable borrow here, second mutable borrow occurs later, compile will check that and will enforce that to me. Um, I, I said we were gonna talk about uh, anster versus string again. Here, here's a basic explainer of it. I don't think any of this will be surprising to you guys right now. Um, this, this, uh, syntax at the bottom here is called slicing, which lets you take like ranges of references and that turns it into a reference to an array with the with the length that that slice produces. There's cool stuff there. We won't cover it too much. Okay. Here's actually the magic of lifetimes. Here, here's where it works. Uh, I think every C++ developer in the world has written a version of this program. Um, I define a function bar. That bar returns a reference to an integer. Inside the function, I make a local variable in, I assign tetan to it, and then I return a reference to in. I may have forgotten an ampersand on the return there, but um, it's fine. In main, then, I get, I get the i back, I get a value back from bar and I print it out. It seg faults. It will seg fault every time. It will deterministically seg fault. Why? It is a use after free. I made a reference to in, which existed in the scope of this function. I hit the close brace, in was destructed, in went away, and then down here I tried to print in when that memory was no longer owned by my program. I used after free. Okay. You can see that would be on the stack. So it would actually be a free Yeah, you just, you would have a variable that you possibly have that data inside. I think technically by C, it could be on the stack or it could be on the heap, depending on what the lower lane, what, what the compiler chose to do. In this case, it would absolutely be on the stack. But rules of the language and how those rules actually manifest in assembly code can be different things. Um, let's write that same program in Rust. Let's try it. 
I say function bar. I say I'm returning a reference to an integer. Let j equals 10 return and j, and I'm printing it. Oh my god, looks looks super the same, except Rust won't compile right now. I'm returning a reference, and it says, I don't know what the lifetime of this reference that you're returning is. References has this, this concept that go along with them called their lifetime, which allows the compiler to reason about how long that reference is value, valid for. Again, here's how fucking good the Rust compiler me error messages are. Hey, you probably meant to do this. And it tells me I probably meant to say I want to return a reference to static data. Why? Because I'm not taking any other data in right now. How the fuck could I return a reference to any other data besides static data if I have access to no local 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 data? So it knows that, hey, you probably wanted to return a reference to static data. So, okay, here's version two now. I'm saying fn bar returns a static reference to u32. I'm returning a reference that is guaranteed to exist for the length of the program. Let j equals 10 return j. Oh, wait a second. It knows that the lifetime of j is shorter than the lifetime I told it. I was going to return and says returns a reference to data owned by the current function cannot return a reference to local variable j fucking cool so um the correct way to write this and the only correct way to write this is function bar returns a static reference return a reference to the number 10 and that number 10 will then be a compile time constant and actually static data in my executable and everything happy and it works um I have a question. yes where does 10 live uh, 10 will live in the data section of your binary that is produced. So uh, again, like any any strings that you write, there will be a data section in your binary where that data is, and the actual assembly code, the reference will be a pointer relative to within that own uh, binary to the to the data section of it. Um, so here's a here's a super common function that you might want to write um, in Rust. It's kind of a dumb one because this isn't how you should find a substring in Rust, but I made an example here. Um, what I want to do is write a function that looks at a string, finds a substring within it, and returns a reference to where that substring is within the original string. That's my goal. So I'm gonna take in an input. Oh, back. I'm gonna take in an input. I'm gonna call the find operation on it. I'm calling unwrap here. Unwrap is uh, very, very bad. <laughs> unwrap is one of the cheater ways. So if you if you don't care about panicking, unwrap, I'm this is returning an option, and I'm saying if it returns none, panic is what unwrap does. Uh, if you write around a lot of unwraps in your code, people get mad at you, but um, there's, there's the cheater ways out because I wanted to make this example as, as short as possible. I am then returning a reference to input, and I'm using this range specifier syntax to return a reference to the slice of the input where we actually found the substring. So I'm returning a, a, a reference to a chunk of memory that has a start and an end that is where that substring occurred within the original data, um, which could be very useful if I wanted to modify in place later in the program or, or delete that chunk out. Okay, it's, it's red squiggly underlined, why? Lifetimes. We have to specify lifetimes. I try to compiler compile this, and the, the compiler will, in most cases, try to work out the lifetimes for you. Whenever it can automatically reason about lifetimes with functions, it will and will just correctly assume the correct lifetime. In this case, it cannot correctly assume the lifetime because it doesn't know how the lifetime of the returned type relates to the lifetimes of the references that came in. It could either be the lifetime of the first one the lifetime of the second one, or static. Those are the only options um, for expressing how long that data lives when I return it. And so look at this fucking compile, compile message. This is so good. Um, help, this function's return type contains a borrowed value, but the signature does not say whether it is borrowed from input or pattern. Consider introducing a named lifetime parameter. And it tells us almost exactly how to solve this problem for us. So. What is this saying now? This is saying find, find substring is my function. Find substring is naming a lifetime. All that naming A does here is give me a way to refer to a specific lifetime in other places in my function signature. In this case, I don't care about the lifetime of pattern because after this function returns, pattern can go away, pattern can appear, whatever. I know that pattern will be guaranteed to exist for the life of this function by the compiler. I don't need to say anything else. I'm now saying input though, will have the lifetime A, and what I return will, must have the same matching lifetime. I'm returning a reference to that same data, and its lifetime must match. 
that's fucking cool. Um, it gets really weird in 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 higher levels of Rust when you start dealing with async code and multiple threads and other stuff. Like you can have a, a hard time writing the right lifetime logic, but most of the time it's super simple. Um, this function now validly compiles, and here's the example I was looking for earlier with standard mem drop. Um, I say let data equals hello world dot two string. I say let sub equals find substring in the input data and with the pattern world. So this should return a reference into data that is where world is, actually inside its memory. I then drop data. I, I, that is the same as, as destructing it. I throw away the data, the, the, uh, the contents of data, the, I deallocate it, and then I try to print sub, and the compiler won't let me. And it will say, cannot move out of data because it is borrowed. The borrow of data occurred here and is later used here, and the, the compiler knows that while sub still exists, sub is pointing to the same memory that data has. And if data goes out of scope, sub would be an invalid reference. And so it won't let me drop that data while there is a reference still to it that it knows. This is a thing in Rust that is just called the borrow checker. And it is what provides so much of this just higher compile time safety than what was ever possible in C or C++. All right, first let's cool. <laughs> Second, it looks like what you're doing there is pointer arithmetic, basically. Like you're taking, you know, an advanced yeah. index inside of the, the array. Yep. Except that you have a lunt attached to it. What's going on? Um, is the slice creating a copy of something and then returning it? It is returning a reference to an array that starts at a point and has a length. So what is actually happening here is the way that this is invoked is I say input. I'm saying the array operator on input to access the array from starting index to ending index exclusively, and then I'm creating a reference to that. And what the actual type of this now is a reference to an array with a starting point and end point. Stir here, if we go, if we go back, is, is a fixed array. Um, yeah, it actually, <clears throat> it's variable length. So you're not dropping a zero into the array like you would see. No, no. Uh, they're, uh, yeah, the, the arrays aren't null terminated. The arrays know their own length in the compiler. And you can have multiple references to the same data in the array. Yep. You can even, Rust will sometimes be smart enough that I can have an array. Um, I can split it into two arrays that are pointing at the same memory and then drop one of those and it'll be okay because it knows that the array indices are not overlapping and we'll be able to prove that in the compiler. Like, it can do crazy shit. Um, yes. So on the previous slide, uh, at the, the substring, it knows at compile time the, the size of substring? It does, because it knows that what the size of the world is. Okay, the carrots on find substring that I would assume is passing a generic template. That's passing in the lifetime. The yeah, so this same carrot here, it will. In, uh, Rust doesn't do a great job of distinguishing between lifetimes and templates, and and lifetimes are a type of templating. Um, there's not necessarily going to be like monomorphization happening and like separate instances of it created, but this is a way of being generic here, where this this function is generic over the lifetime of the input. Um, and we'll accept different, that's the way that Rust talks about it internally. We're definitely at the point where like, I'm giving you guys the primer and the Rust book is awesome and we'll explain it better than I can. Um, but I think I didn't fuck it up too terribly. <laughs> um, so again, like this is this is the, the magic of the borrow checker. This is how Rust provides fearless concurrency. Um, Rust can completely convent, prevent at compile time, use after free and data races. That's insane. Like, what it requires, though, is you have to do more work. The function signatures of functions in Rust are fundamentally more complex than function signatures in C++ because they must provide this lifetime information. There is no way in a C++ function signature to tell the compiler what the relative lifetimes are of the, of the types that come into it. Um, so there's this extra information that you have to provide in Rust when you're working with references, but when you provide it, by the other guarantees of the language, the language is completely uh, thread safe. 
Um, these restrictions by themselves, it would be impossible to do any of this then. Like I, I already mentioned Mutex earlier, Rust has a bunch of higher level types then that provide ways of working safely around this restriction if you want to do interior mutability, but you have to do them by using something like a mutex type and that mutex type then implements the locking and implements it correctly. And there's half a dozen mutex implementations and channels and read write locks and semaphores and all these other higher level types that people have built on these low level rules. Um, and there's almost always a little bit of unsafe code somewhere in the heart of them where, you know, the author of the mutex has said, I can now guarantee that I'm safe to have a mutable reference to this piece of data. Um, even though you normally wouldn't let me, I'm allowed to break that rule in this chunk of code because by other things I've done, I know it's safe in this case. So it probably means that most syscalls have wrapper around it. Every single syscall has an unsafe wrapper around it. Yep, yep. Uh, but uh, the people writing those, are doing a very good job, um, I, I have well, I to mean, say. I, I understand why they want to this, this makes a lot of sense. There's a lot of classes going through this world. Yeah, um, uh, here's, I, I really want to point you guys, like I'm giving you a primer, I'm talking about a lot of stuff. Um, there are some amazing Rust learning resources. Um, the Rust book is the shit. Um, it is written by Steve Klavanach, who is one of the most effective communicators I have ever dealt with. Um, there is a complete free PDF online. The entire thing is on GitHub, you can make pull requests if you want it edited. Um, it is written in Markdown and they use a program called Rust Doc or Rust Book to generate yeah, uh, the actual book from it. Um, it is incredibly well written and covers everything I covered here in much more detail. Um, I, there are print copies available from Search Free Press. I love those. Um, there is a follow on book that I don't think is published in, in paper copy yet, but is personally the best Rust reference I have found for when I don't actually want to read the book. I want to say, okay, how do I do types? Okay, yeah, I want to know how to do typecasting. Also, these come up in Google's. It's just examples. Like, it's not the written explanation of everything, but just piles and piles of here's how to do typecasting in Rust. Um, very well done. Sorry, I'll make this slightly bigger. Um, but yeah, here's the, the as keyword is how you do typecasting and here's how you do uh, typecasting and, and different ways of doing it. Um, there's also some pretty amazing uh, YouTube videos. I think John Jengset is by far my favorite. Um, he is an open source maintainer and just does very good YouTube videos where he will just like, hey, I want to write a program that does this in Rust. And it's like a two hour follow along with him as he works through writing and explains how he's writing it, explains the compiler errors he hits and how to fix them. There's also this amazing uh, keynote from Rust conference a few years ago called Rust for Game Development. Um, this is what I would encourage you all to watch where I said like, don't write Rust like C++, how should you write Rust? That's the reference I would talk, I, I would bring you to. Um, when you have these restrictions about data access, um, Rust becomes much less an object oriented language and much more a data oriented language where, where I define where my data is and then I manipulate that data in different ways with things that operate on the data as pure functions much more than I actually do create objects that have functions and buried in them and the data and the, and the object are mixed together. Um, I, I, I really like it. They, um, she, the, the, the talker here, I can't remember her name, but she wrote an entire game and published a game from scratch in Rust and talked about writing a custom game engine from scratch in Rust and how you work around that like Rust won't let you write on safe code. That can be hard to design a game engine where you have all these things you want to have happening in parallel, but with some different design styles and some different higher level paradigms, it actually becomes super easy. Um, I did mention earlier documentation for every crate in the Rust ecosystem is on DocsRS. I will give you a quick peek of it. Um, I can search any crate in here. I'm going to search my own crate because I, I like my documentation. Here's Ross with Rust. Here's what the documentation for it looks like. This is all actually in the source code with these being documentation comments. You can do inline uh, code in the comments and it will compile and run unit tests on your documentation um, and compile your examples for you um, and test them automatically. Um, I can go back through and see the documentation for previous versions, including a version that had a mistake in it that I yanked. Um, actually, no, it won't let me do that one because I even yanked the documentation. Um, but I can step through my crate. I, it will, I can go to the different modules within my crate, the different structs I defined, see the, the different functions. Here's how you create a new client um, to, to connect to a ROS instance here. It returns an error. Here's my error type I defined. In this case, into here is what we'll cover next time. I am not taking a string and I am not taking a reference. I am taking something which implements the trait that it is possible to convert that thing into a string. 
So I will take any type which is convertible into a string as the input into my function here. Um, but uh, yeah, the documentation is just, it's so easy to write and because it's so easy to write and in such a standardized format, all the crates have good documentation and it's just very nice. So a lot can be learned there. Um, and then uh, this is my little list. If you actually go on the main REST website here, there is way more documentation about how, way more learning resources. Um, um, plotted out. I have personally not done the Rustlings course, but a lot of people recommend the Rustlings course, which brings you through a lot of actually building stuff, like build this thing in Rust and see what goes wrong and sort of hand by hand builds you stuff. So I was only 50% over time with no Q&A. <laughs> I'm proud of myself, guys. I think we did well. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining. I'm sorry for those online that you didn't get to, to join us in person, but uh, thank you all for coming. I'm going to kill the video here, but I'm happy to stay on and answer more questions after this.